So today's presentation will be delivered by uh, Simon French, the Chief Inspector of the Rail Accident Investigation Branch. Uh, last year, Simon presented to our annual conference uh, investigating the accident before it happens. And if you register uh, to receive the REIB reports at GovUK, you'll find that the quality of the investigations, the reports and the recommendations will certainly help with your accident investigations, regardless of your industry. Hopefully, Simon will have some time uh, to discuss some of the very high profile investigations, which I'm sure you'll be familiar with and answer your questions at the end of his presentation. Simon's railway career is very wide ranging, including 16 years in operational roles from the Channel Tunnel link, now known as HS1, uh, the Channel Tunnel itself, Heathrow Express, and the Great Belt Tunnel in Denmark, as well as numerous roles in uh, British Rail, what was then. So Simon's been with the RAIB now for almost 18 years and was appointed the Chief Inspector in 2015. He's responsible for ensuring the RAIB fulfills its primary aim of safety on all matters uh, relating to rail transport, and he reports directly to the Secretary of State for Transport on all matters concerning accident investigation. And like today, Simon frequently engages with stakeholders to promote safe learning and gain an understanding of the RAIB work, including his annual investigation workshop, which I can highly recommend. Welcome, Simon. Well, thank you very much, Ed, for that introduction. Uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I've been part of the railway industry for 40 years now, um, starting in British Rail, as um, Ed mentioned. And for 20 of those 40 years, I've been a member of IOSH and part of the railway group. And I, I've addressed numerous events run by IOSH. It's an ins institution which I have the greatest respect for. So it's a great pleasure to be here. I will be talking about the work of the RAIB. I hope that uh, it's of interest to all of you. Uh, since I'll be retiring uh, early next year, possibly in January or February, uh, I, I've made this piece a little bit reflective. So I'll be talking a little bit about what I've learned over the last 16 years of active uh, accident investigation. So that's me, um, and I hope that you'll all gain something from this presentation. So let me just uh, put the slides up. Okay, so the work of the RAIB. Just a few words of introduction. Um, the origins of the Rail Accident Investigation Branch are very clear. You can track back um, to the dreadful accident on the 5th of October 1999 when two trains collided at Lapwood Grove in London. 31 people were killed, more than 400 injured. The subsequent public inquiry recommended the creation of an independent organisation for the investigation of accidents. And the Rail Accident Investigation Branch stemmed directly from the recommendation from Lord Cullen's inquiry. So we have a very clear starting place. We know where we come from. We come from uh, a tragic event and from the feeling within government, within the rail industry and wider society that there needed to be a single body with the responsibility of investigating accidents. The government put in place the legislation that was needed to make this happen, to create this new body. And the RAIB's first chief inspector, Carolyn Griffiths, was appointed in May of 2003. And of course, Carolyn's first task was to recruit inspectors to find the right people, the right quality, to carry out investigations in the future. And I was very privileged to be recruited first as a principal inspector as part of that first round of recruitment. 
And we spent the first year preparing for live investigations, um, training, putting in place the logistics, the systems and processes that we needed to make this happen, to make it real and make it effective. And eventually the RAIB went live, our powers came into force and we started investigations from the 17th of October, 2005. A day that I still remember like it was yesterday. It was a very major event in all of our professional lives. So a few key facts about the RAIB. The key thing is we're independent from parts of the rail industry. And I guess I sometimes overuse the word independent, but I believe that independence is absolutely at the root of what we do. In order to make a difference to rail safety, people need to believe that we are independent and we do need to be independent in the way that we investigate. So where do we sit? Where do you put an independent body of this type? Well, we sit within the Department of Transport, so we are civil servants. In fact, we need to be civil servants because we have very major legal powers. And of course, we need those legal, legal powers to come from being part of government. But we're entirely independent from the Department for Transport in the way we investigate. Never in all our, my time in the RAIB has there been any attempt by government to interfere with our work. And that's really important because we stand apart from government whilst being part of government for the purpose of budget and governance. Now, I'm very lucky because my job description is very, very simple. A lot of us have very complicated, multifaceted job descriptions, but in fact, the role of the RAIB is very simple. It is the improvement of railway safety. And that implies, of course, if that's our sole role, that we do not apportion blame or liability. We've all heard the term no blame investigation, but it matters that we that all of those that come in contact with us understand that we do not, uh, we do not apportion blame, and we're not here to determine who is liable. We are purely here for determining safety learning. Another key element of Lord Cullum, Cullen's recommendation was that there should be a single party that had the clear and lead responsibility for the investigation of the accident. And that is where the RAIB comes in. We work with other bodies, we work the police force, we work the safety regulator. Of course we do. They're there, they have their own duties to perform, but we act as the lead point in pulling together the evidence, analysing that evidence and publishing the findings of our investigation. So what is our scope? Well, our scope, scope involves pretty well anything that runs on rails. Mainline railways, freight, passenger, metro systems, and of course, tramway systems. The top right there, you'll see the tragic aftermath of the accident at Sandylands that resulted in the death of seven passengers. Now, scope does include heritage railway systems such as this narrow gauge line here. This is the uh, Welsh Highland line, but we cover all of the heritage railway systems, which of course includes quite a lot of historical legacy infrastructure and rolling stock, which we have to understand and investigate. So in summary, if it's on rails, we investigate. A little bit about how we work. I'm gonna start by talking about the creation of an independent accident investigation branch. When you're faced with a scene, such as you can see in the photograph there, you have a challenge. You have an awful lot to do. You cannot simply turn up with a notebook or a camera and investigate. You need a whole infrastructure behind you. People, you need the right people with the expertise to walk onto a scene such as that and immediately understand the situation and to be able to ask the right questions. So recruitment was a key, key first activity of the RAIB, and we continually recruit to top up our, our people as people retire and move on. So expertise, absolutely fundamental to what we do. 
kit, vehicle, equipment. Moving on to a site, some of our sites are very remote. Uh, they, we need to reach those sites. Uh, we need to protect ourselves while we're on the site. So we need the equipment to take all the measurements uh, that we need uh, when we're on site. We need management systems and processes. We need to understand how we work so that we work in a consistent way, uh, that there's a structure and a process to the way that we investigate. We need support, logistical support. Uh, anything from booking of hotels uh, to welfare on site. We need legal powers because independence means nothing without the legal powers to obtain the evidence and support that we need. And I'll come back to that as, as I proceed. Policy and procedures, budget, working relationships with the rail industry and the government, all of these things really matter if we're to investigate. But if you're to walk onto a scene, you also need one thing more than anything else, and that's clear, clarity of purpose. You need to understand why you, why you are there. And we have a mission, a very simple mission. And our mission is to investigate uh, in order to inform the public and to learn lessons for the, for, for the rail industry. And that is our clarity of purpose. So what does RAIB actually look like in practice? We're not a vast organisation. We have 24 inspectors and a support team that provide the logistical backup to those inspectors. And the, the inspectors are distributed between two offices, one in Farnborough, that's in the south of the UK, and one in Derby in the north part uh, of England. Um, and you can see that gives us a good geographical spread, but it also means we can get the people we need. Um, we, we, it, Derby in particular is a, a, a well-established engineering centre, and it was a really good place uh, to be able to attract uh, the very best engineers and operators too. Farnborough gives us easy access to London, uh, the massive rail sy system in London. So we have two operational centres, we have vehicles and workshops at both centres so that we're able to deploy by road at short notice. And our teams of inspectors are on a 24-7 on-call roster. We need to be able to deploy very quickly. In fact, we are committed to deploy to the most serious of accidents within 30 minutes. And that can happen any time of the day, any day of the week. Um, and, and so that readiness to deploy is a fundamental part of the way we operate. And we publish 25 to 30 publications per year. And these are spread between major reports. These are our gold standard investigation reports, which many of you will have seen, but also our shorter form safety digests. Now I mentioned earlier, legality, the legal structure. This really matters. I've always said that in order to be truly independent, you need to have some teeth. If you are entirely dependent on the goodwill of others, and normally we do get the goodwill of others, but if we're entirely dependent on the goodwill of others, then others are able to keep, keep information from us and our ability to investigate in an effective and independent way is jeopardized. So the law matters. We need to have the legal backup. Following Lord Cullen's recommendation that there should be an RAIB, an RAIB had to be created as a legal entity. And that was done through an act of parliament, the Railways and Transport Safety Act 2003. Now, this is a, this is a, this is a heavy duty piece of legislation, but it needed to be because we have powers, very extensive powers, and powers can only be provided by means of an act of parliament. So that was the bedrock of the RAIB and continues to be the bedrock of the RAIB. But the act created the RAIB and it gave inspectors of the RAIB powers, but there was much else beside that needed to be put in place in terms of detailed regulations 
which put obligations on other parties to cooperate with the RAIB, to work with the RAIB, but also put certain duties upon the RAIB itself. And that was the Railways Accident Investigation and Reporting Regulations 2005. And they've remained pretty much the same. They've changed a little, most recently in, in January two, uh, 2021, to accommodate our departure from the EU. But the regulations remain much as they were back in 2005 and have served us very well. If you're interested, much more guidance on our Act and the regulations is published on our website. The regulations are complex as they need to be, but in fact, the, the essence I've put onto this slide, just to get the, the real uh, central points of our regulations. And the first is that we have immediate and unrestricted access to an accident site or any railway property. We are able to seize evidence and we have a right to interview witnesses. And that is anyone that we deem to be relevant to our investigation, whether they're part of the rail industry or not, we have that right uh, to interview witnesses. We also have the right to examine and test evidence. And that is, is absolutely bread and butter to us. This is something do, we do on a regular basis, taking the evidence from the site, um, bringing it to our facilities, maybe taking it to a specialized laboratory, whatever's necessary, uh, we're able to examine and test ev ev evidence. Anything from a very small widget or a screw or a bolt or whatever it might be to an entire train. And we have in fact seized trains, trams uh, as part of our investigation. We also have access to personal data and communication records. And these, these rights of access, of course, are very hard to come by, but are essential to work we do. So we do interrogate mobile phone records, um, personal data, medical data, anything that's necessary in order to understand what has happened on an accident site. We can also require witnesses to answer our questions. So witnesses do not have the right of silence with the RAIB. They are required to answer our questions since these questions only relate to safety learning. And that power is most unusual and a power we use very carefully, but is absolutely essential to the way we work. And it is a criminal offence to mislead an RAIB inspector. Now, I should stress at this point, we very rarely need to use our powers. I mean, we have warrants, very rarely do we deploy them in anger. But having those powers in our back pocket is essential to the way we work. And very rarely do we need to remind witnesses of their obligation to tell us the truth and to tell us that everything they know about the circumstances of an accident. But where necessary, we can use those powers. With powers come obligations. There's another side to the coin. Because witnesses are obliged to answer our questions, we must therefore protect the identity of the witnesses and we do not disclose the records of interviews with any other party unless the witness chooses to disclose them themselves. So this is, this is about the protection of the witness and ensuring that when they tell us all that they know, they are not incriminating themselves which would be contrary to their human rights, of course. We do not share personal information, which can be very, very sensitive in nature. We also have duties to consult with other bodies before carrying out destructive examination or testing. So on occasions, of course, we actually need to damage or change the state of a piece of evidence in order to test it. And we would do that after consultation with the police or the safety regulator as the case may be. And we provide, we share evidence with other statutory bodies so that those bodies know if we take a piece of evidence from site, which they would like to have access to at a later stage, they know that we have secured that evidence to police standards and that we will share that evidence in the future. 
And that's important because that avoids conflict on accident sites. So we are not alone. There are other bodies that have a duty to investigate. The safety regulator, the Office of Rail and Road, has a duty to enforce safety legislation and will be investigating many, not all, but many of the accidents we investigate. And the police have a duty to investigate to see if a crime has been committed, but also to carry out a sudden death investigation to support a coroner at a late stage. Now these investigations overlap, but they are distinctly different, very different in nature. They overlap, and the way this overlap works, where we have in place a memorandum of understanding with these bodies, which allows for the sharing of technical evidence, for effective communication and cooperation, whilst respecting each other's duties and the parallel nature of our investigations. So those MOUs work very well for us. It means that when we go to an accident site and we meet a British transport policeman, uh, we, we, are, we have a common point of reference, which has been agreed by the senior management team of both organisations. And that has, these, these MOUs have worked very, very well in practice. Very rare do we have disputes on, on, on site. When they do occur, we're able to resolve that without causing delay or unnecessary conflict. Process. We need to have a process. And the process starts with notification. Duty holders, that is railway duty holders, have a duty to notify us of an accident. So we know an accident has occurred very, very quickly, often within minutes. Uh, and that, that comes directly from the duty holders. We then have to decide how to respond. We get far more notifications than we're able to investigate. So we have a structured process to decide how to respond. If we go to site, we gather the evidence from the site. And this is a critical phase, of course. We need to collect evidence whilst it's vulnerable or perishable. We need to collect it quickly and to the highest possible standards. Very often, we'll carry out tests and examinations, sometimes on, on site, but sometimes at a laboratory elsewhere. Having gathered the evidence, absolutely essential to what we do is causal analysis, analyzing this evidence, understanding what it means. We then consult on our findings. We go back to the duty holders, the bodies that we've investigated, and we seek further information, a conversation, a dialogue about our emerging findings. At the end, we will publish what we believe is appropriate, but always after a process of consultation. And finally, we report, we publish the report and recommendations. Always publish. We do not write secret reports. We publish everything we do on our website. It's av available for anyone, anyone in the UK or anyone in the world to read, and everyone is welcome to do so and we always welcome feedback. A few words about analysis, because it is at the heart of what we do. At the simplest level, you can see an accident as a chain of events. It's a very simple chain of events that led to a collision, starting at the bottom with the distraction of a driver. The driver makes the error, he passes the signal of danger, and there is a collision. And very often when I look back to my days in British Rail, our investigations didn't go much further than this simple chain of events, but it really doesn't tell you very much at all. So how do you go wider? Well, of course, there are always other aspects. Distraction, can that really be a full and complete explanation of why an accident occurred? Why did someone became dis become distracted on that particular occasion? Were they fatigued? Were there issues with the signal sighting, which meant that a short loss of attention meant that they lost the signal aspect, did not see the aspect? Weather conditions, maybe they were a factor. 
could in, could in themselves be a distraction? Why did a signal pass that danger result in a collision? Perhaps there was an absence in the train protection system. So all the time, causal analysis digs deeper and allows you to go wider. And behind each of these factors, fatigue, distraction, signal sighting, other factors, and, and our technique really boils down to a series of questions. Something happened. Why did it happen? It happened because. Why because? Why did that happen? Why because? And this process of continually asking questions to understand a factor until you can ask no more questions is the heart of all accident investigations. There are many different techniques out there. There are many different ways of investigating, but they all boil down to a simple process of asking questions in a systematic and objective way that allows proper and deep safety learning. And at the deepest level, you get out of the level of direct cause causality to the level of underlying factors. Perhaps in this case, a lack of a learning culture that hadn't learned from previous incidents or perhaps a reluctance to report due to a, a culture of blame, a feeling that if you, if you report something, there will be repercussions, and those repercussions will be bad. So going deeper allows you to learn lessons. So that's just a, a flavor of how we work. I'm going to say a few words about our investigation methods. Surveying. When we go to site, very often we're trying to look for physical evidence on the site that tells us something about what has occurred. And this evidence, even the smallest detail, can make a very real difference to understanding of event. So in the case here, you see here the site of the tragic overturning event at Sandylands in, uh, back in 2015, a ma very major event which that led to, to, to seven fatalities. And here you can see the very detailed analysis and how over time this allowed to, un to understand how the track overturned the exact sequence of events. Um, photogrammetry and the use of drones. What you're going to see here, I'll run a very short sequence. Hopefully you can all see that. This is this is uh, an image prepares using a drone fitted with very special cameras fed through software that allows us to create a three dimensional image of a very difficult site. This in fact is the approach to Liverpool Lime Street. Uh, that site would have been very, very difficult to survey by conventional methods, but by fitting cameras that allow us to take dimensions from a three-dimensional image. It's essentially a cloud of pixels. We're able to create these rather incredible images. Yes, I know it looks like a photograph, but trust me, it isn't. It is a cloud of pixels, and you're able to measure between any two points in that cloud of pixels. And all of that collected from a drone, allowing us to get pictures that can never be obtained from the ground. Collection on site, these sites can be difficult. Uh, they can be very extensive. And we train our people to work effectively in these ways and, in, and safely, of course, safety, absolutely fundamental to working on site. Recovery, as I mentioned earlier, can be any, every, anything from the very smallest components on the left-hand side, of, or very large. Here we see an, an entire set of S, half set of S and C being lifted out of the track at uh, uh, Grey Rig in uh, Cumbria. Sometimes we take those components to labs for testing. OTDR, black box data, again, fundamental to what we do. The analysis of black box data, in, increasingly we're getting vast amounts of data from black boxes. I think now on train data recorders, the challenge for us now is less obtaining data, but analysing huge amounts of data from multiple channels. But we're able to do that now uh, through years of experience and extract very quickly the information that really matters to us. 
Sometimes we send samples to laboratories. You see here laboratory analysis of a, a metallurgical analysis of a failure in a TRAX group. And reconstruction, trying to reconstruction, reconstruct a sequence of events in order to really understand how something has occurred. And what you see here is a reconstruction of a driver ducking beneath um, two uh, freight vehicles and in the process coming to contact with a electrified third rail. And unfortunately, the accident concern here was fatal. We wanted to understand exactly what has occurred and how it was that he received an electric, electric shock sufficient to kill him. And of course, computer modeling and visualization, fundamental to understanding of events. And this is the three-dimensional modeling that was carried out. Again, this was for the Sandylands accident. Using that survey data, we were able, and witness marks on the train, on the infrastructure, able to create a very exact representation of what occurred on that uh, dreadful morning. Very often we look into software, into the coding itself and the design and the validation of software. Uh, and this, in fact, this, this graphic was taken from the investigation into the loss of safety critical data from uh, ERTMS specification uh, signaling system on the Cambrian line in the, in the UK some five years ago. And of course, the deeper learning, the organizational factors. And in order to, to work through the organizational factors, we definitely developed our own methodology that combines both the, ele the key elements of the safety management system with the organizational culture that takes us into reporting culture, leadership, corporate values that are so that, that, un, that underpin, underlie so many of the accidents that we investigate. Okay, so I'm aware time's ticking on. So I, I just wanted to pick up on some recent RAIB investigations before drawing some conclusions. Um, we have very recently published an investigation into a fatal accident at Waterloo Underground Station. And this is this is just an example I, I, I just wanted to give you, to give you a flavour of the, the nature of our work and how we go deeper than the obvious. What happened here is a passenger fell into the gap between the train and the very curved platform. Those of you that have been to London will know that many of the platforms on our stations, and particularly on the underground stations, are very curved. This is a historical legacy. It would be many years uh, before these curves can be removed. So we have to manage the risk of curvature. And the driver wasn't able to see the person before the train departed. And as a consequence, the train departed with tragic consequences. And we identified a possible underlying factor that London Underground had neither fully quantified the level of risk for the platform concerned nor considered additional measures to reduce the risk beyond those that were already there. This involved us looking at the CCTV images that were presented to the, the driver in the head wall of the tunnel uh, to, to ascertain the extent to which the driver was able to see someone who had fallen into the gap and was unable to get out, in the, out from the gap between the train and the platform. So in this case, we did a reconstruction and placed a mannequin, if you like a dummy, into that gap, and then looked at the image, photographed the images to see whether in fact it was possible for a driver to see someone in the gap. And the report identified that the, the person in that gap would have been very, very difficult to see indeed with the cameras positioned as they were with the quality of image as it was displayed. As I say, we looked at the quantified risk model and concluded that the understanding of system risk would be improved if the model was able to identify higher risk locations and the associated risk of harm to passengers. The model was able to provide an estimate of, uh, of platform train interface risk 
for the entire LUL network and for each individual line, but not for hazards, uh, for known hazards at, at uh, high hazard locations. Eden Park was an interesting investigation recently published. Um, this identified that a visually impaired passenger had walked off the edge of a platform almost certainly because he was unaware of his proximity to the edge of the platform. And the platform edge was not part, marked by tactile surface markings. Now, tactile surface markings are provided at slightly over half of the stations on the UK national network. But it hadn't, they hadn't been uh, installed at all stations. And we concluded that the industry processes did not give adequate justification uh, consideration to the safety justification for platform edge markings. We also identified that the provision of medical assistance to the person on the track was delayed awaiting confirmation that the power had been switched off. And this, this shows you on the left hand side, the uh, platform at a station with tactile strips and these are these strips have little bumps you'll all be familiar with them which show people with in, uh, visual impairment they can feel through their feet that they are approaching the end of the platform and on the right hand side the platform at Eden Park. We're currently investigation investigating the derailment of a passenger train at Carmont in Aberdeenshire in Scotland on the 12th of August last year. This investigation is focused very heavily on the weather conditions on the time and the effect they had on the drainage system, quite a recently installed drainage system. But in fact, the stones in, this, in the drainage trench were washed out onto the track, derailed the rolling stock with the consequences that you can see in these photographs. So we're looking now at how the railway responds to extreme weather events the associated management and decision making processes and the design installation and maintenance of the drainage and of course the behavior of the train when it struck the landslip. So I'll move on quickly now because I'm aware that time is a little short. I will talk about bring some conclusions to you. So I've spent 16 happy years with the RAIB. These are uh, some of the best years of, of, of my career. I've had in exposure to so much learning. I've learned myself so much about the rail industry, every aspect from top to bottom. So what, what have I taken away from my 16 years with the RAIB? First of all, is real conviction about the power and the importance of accident investigation. Accident investigation gives you focus. It allows you to go deep and to dig deeper and deeper and not to stop at the obvious. Looking beyond compliance with process, looking into the adequacy of that process, the underlying factors, the management processes, all absolutely critical. Connectivity, the links between different parts of a system, highlighted, spot brought out into the if you like, the searchlight of an investigation, understanding the links, links that sometimes were not previously appreciated. Also, investigators should be empowered. They should be empowered to follow causal chains wherever they may lead and however uncomfortable that may be to the powers that be. So empowerment is essential. And climate, in the immediate aftermath of an investigation there is a willingness to cooperate which is very is very is very encouraging we still see it there's a very strong safety culture in the rail industry and a very real determination to cooperate with the investigators and that gives accident investigation real power what else have i taken away the first thing is that i am not and none of my inspectors are sherlock holmes he always manages to solve everything and to explain every single aspect with a high degree of certainty. The real world isn't like that. That's 
that's entertaining. It, that's entertainment, but it's not the real world. Investigators need not be afraid of uncertainty. Uncertainty is part of the job and should always be clearly presented as part of an investigation. We caveat our findings where appropriate with terms like probable and possible. It's important that uncertainty is managed well by investigators. And that for me is a key learning I've taken away. We're not Sherlock Holmes. We're not here to find the absolute, absolute certainty. We present uncertainty where we come across it. Communication matters. Good investigations do make a real difference, but they have to be well communicated. And the route to that is traceability. From traceability through to the facts and evidence, through to analysis, to findings, to summary of conclusions, and ultimately to recommendations. All of these things should track through. I hope and believe if you take a report, you are able to trace right through from beginning to end and see how they all link together. There is nothing worse than an investigation that has a set of recommendations that appear to have no relation to the findings of the investigation. So that, that makes a difference. If you want, to, you want to make safety improvements in the future, you have to communicate that safe safety learning effectively and well. Something else I've come away, there's this term that's often used, safety too. I don't know if, how many of you come across it, but, but for investigators, I learned a long time ago that if you want to understand what went wrong, you have to understand how the rail industry normally delivers a safe outcome. 99.999% of the time, the outcome is safe. And before you understand what, what went wrong, you need to understand what normally goes right? Why does it normally deliver safety? And then you can understand the weaknesses in the system. Most accidents don't involve people who were reckless or irresponsible. Most involve people who are simply trying their best to get the job done. Ed mentioned this earlier, but I mentioned it again because I believe it passionately. I believe the techniques of accident investigation can be applied and should be applied before the accident, before someone has been hurt. Techniques such as HAZOP, fault tree analysis, FMEA, all of these things, bow tie analysis, all of these are techniques that allow us to understand the potential causes of an accident before it occurs. And I believe that the systematic approach to understanding the potential causes of accident really can avoid the need for accident investigation. Wouldn't that be great if you didn't need us? So safety analysis is not dry and uninteresting. It's a creative process and it requires those involved to have the requisite imagination, if I can borrow that term, to conceive of the very worst of outcomes and the stems, steps that are needed to avoid them. We need to step out between, away from our immediate experience and to imagine, imagine the potential ways in which our safety de defences can fail. So thank you very much. Uh, I hope that's been of interest. Um, I'm happy, of course, to answer any questions um, or, 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 or to listen to any, uh, any counter views. But uh, thank you very much for your time and uh, we'll see what, uh, see what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, I, it never fails to um, inspire me and I learn at every single opportunity when you've had a presentation. And um, I was putting some questions down, but I think I can go straight because we've got so many. I think if we can go straight to the top. Um, with Adrian, who's talking about the uh, different marine air accident investigations and is it time we had a structures accident investigation branch um, to remove the current um, different organizations I think is uh, what, what uh, Adrian's talking about. Uh, many structures we see failures on, uh, would it warrant its own investigation branch? 
Ah, what a what an interesting question. Um, you're quite right. There are three uh, transport investigation branches. Uh, have, uh, colleagues, uh, marine and air, and we we'd work very well to, together, and we work very closely together through an organisation we've created called the Accident Invest Accident. Uh, Sorry, the Accident Chief Inspector, so I'll start again. The Accident Investigation Chief Inspectors Council. So we um, work together um, and share experience. And that has, I form the opinion, having worked very closely with other branches, we should continue to work very closely in that way. Who knows, there may be future investigation branches. There is currently a road collision investigation project looking at the business case for a similar no blame independent investigation body for the UK road system. So maybe that'll come in the future. Um, and there is also now within the a within the air accident investigation branch, a space investigation capability just been introduced. So things are moving on. However, could we go wider? Yes, structures. I mean, Grenfell Tower, fire safety in buildings, surely there, there is some deeper safety learning, quite separate from questions of liability and responsibility, some deeper safety learning. How was it that uh, a building was able to be built uh, with unsafe materials? So is there, is, there, is, there, is, there, is there a case for a wider body? Well, that's an interesting question. But what I will say is the Dutch have uh, built um, a, a safety investigation branch, which or body, which covers all modes, including high hazard industries, earthquakes, even for that matter, mass shooting events can be covered by the Dutch branch. And they've done that in an integrated way. And it covers, includes transport, includes hospital safety, includes all of these things. So there are some deeper questions there about the scope of the future for uh, a single body, it's an option, or you continue to have separate bodies, but working very closely together. What is very clear is that no blame independent safety investigation is fundamental to improving the safety um, uh, across a wide range of sectors. And of course, structures totally agree. You can th think of all sorts of areas where we should be doing more independent investigation. So thank you for the question. It was very very uh, interesting. Much shorter one this time, um, Simon. And I almost went to answer this and then I had to hold back. Um, does the top management of the Department of Transport exert any influence taking in consideration the public media? Do they exert influence on our investigations? No, it wasn't no. the investigation, it was the media. It was very, it was very specific. So when the publicity comes out, um, you've got your own, I assume, your own communications. But does the Department for Transport have any influence on their own um, media regarding your investigations? Uh, well, that's that's interesting. Um, we we publish our own, um, uh, as as everyone will be aware, I think, our own press releases. Uh, we have our own website, and we are entirely independent in the way that we do that. Um, we do, of course, keep the, the, the DFT informed of what we're about to say. We don't. Um, so they are aware of it and they will sometimes have their own comments to make um, regarding, particularly after we've published a report, uh, an interim report, perhaps, or a, a final report following a very, very major accident. So they have their own position. They have their own press office. They have their own uh, position on, on, on matters, but they don't exert any influence over our material and neither do we influence their material, but we do, we do of course, talk to each other. So we are, we are aware of the wider implications of what we're about to publish. Uh, and of course, the DRT are aware of what we are about to say, but um, no, we, 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 keep, we keep at arm's length. OK, um, I'm going to have to go through much quicker now because the questions are pouring in. Um, yep. uh, Kevin Pollitt, do you have any investigation systems, for example, uh, Taproot or Topset? 
Kelvin top step tripod beta. I must admit they're new to me. So um, you did mention you did use some, but. Um... We have developed our own system, um, which is, is um, essentially a combination of timeline analysis and fault tree analysis. Uh, and it served us very well. We will sometimes use other techniques. We have used Aximat quite recently, uh, which is a tool that some, some, some of you will know. We are aware of the, a wide range of tools out there and they all have, they all have their place and their value. Uh, we've, we've, I guess what we've tried to do is to adopt the principles of the best of these systems and, and tie it into our own methodology. So we work to our own process um, we're aware of these other processes. They all have a place. One thing I would say is beware of too much complexity because accident investigation, and this is something we all need to bear in mind, accident investigation in principle is simple. In practice can be very complicated, but the principle ought to be simple. We ought, you ought to be able to track very simply cause and effect. Um, and if you track cause and effect, it should and will always take you to the underlying deep, deeper factors and some of the societal factors that you might want to bring out. Um, so these, these techniques are all there and I'm not going to dismiss any of them. We use, you use our own variant uh, and it, it served us very well. Um, if anyone wants to know a little bit more and they can contact me directly, I'll give you, give you a little bit more detail. We do sometimes, we have presented elements of, of this at our um, at our rail industry um, good practice seminar. So if you come along to the seminar, sometimes you'll see elements of our process. Um, so yeah, but the the, the um, please don't get. I would say please don't get too much drawn into the the science of these things. The principles are quite straightforward. It seems to us. A uh, nice quick one now, which I think even I know the answer to. Um, when we return to Great British Railways, will it make your job any easier? I don't think it'll make any difference with the powers you've got anyway. <laughs> well, it, well, it's an interesting question. Will it introduce uh, a single guiding mind? Um, and does that make our job any easier? I, I, I don't know. We'll have to see how it plays out. I think in the new structure of the railway, there'll still be a large number of different rail industry bodies. We deal with very large number of rail industry bodies. I think that'll be true in the future. Um, we, obviously, obviously, we at the moment have a very close working relationship with the bigger bodies such as Network Rail, RSSB, but uh, uh, I, I, I would see that Great British Railways is just another body that we'll have to deal with. So I, I think the jury's out on that. I think it's early days. I can't really, uh, I can't really say. In principle, it might make it a little easier when we're dealing with system-wide issues that affect both rolling stock and track. Yeah, and, and the next question is uh, is probably one that um, we know the answer to. I think you covered it. Can the RAIB reports be used as evidence in criminal prosecutions? Presumably not. Presumably not, as the RAIB is safety learning only. Therefore, do HSEORR carry out a standalone, separate investigations to meet their own goals? And I think the answer to that is yes. Well, our reports are published and anyone can use our reports, pick them off our website. However, they are of limited value in a criminal case because of the because of the, the way they're produced. You know, they are they are they are they are admissible in court, but are very rarely used in court uh, because they're developed for a different purpose. So they aren't very helpful generally to either the defense or the prosecution. So the answer is, in principle, they can, but very rarely are used in criminal cases. However, and, and because they're not designed uh, to support a defence or prosecution, um, the ORR and the police do their own investigations, and if needs be, will write their own reports, which will form the basis of a submission um, to a, a criminal or civil um, court. So. That's, that's why this process of parallel investigations in, is important because we cannot possibly meet the requirements that others might have in a criminal or civil court. I hope that answers the question. 
Uh, I've got an interesting one. I'd written this one down myself. Does the RAIB work with other countries, rail operators and investigating bodies to get a common understanding between um, other countries? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, we, um, for many years, we are part of the uh, network of EU national investigating bodies. And although we are no longer part of the EU, we still have a relationship with that network with all of the countries in the EU. Uh, we have a particularly close relationship with the Nordic countries and of course with France and Ireland because those two countries have borders with us and we have memorandums of understanding with them. And we're also part of the um, ITSA, which is the International Transport Safety uh, Authority organization and uh, this is an international organization covering all sectors that covers, that goes right across the world, includes the NTSB in the US, includes Australia, includes Singapore, and it, it, it's, it's an international body. So we have a lot of international contacts and a lot of exchange of experience. And on occasions we have assisted investigation by bodies in other countries where, where they've asked that um, uh, assistance from us. And vice versa, we have on occasions asked for advice from others who have particular uh, knowledge in an area. So that international aspect, aspect is really close to my heart, it's really important, it's really active. Um, an interesting question. Um, are we able to read more about the methodology our REIB has developed? The diagrams look interesting. Could you direct us, please? I, th I think I'd also like to, you to mention about the, in your regulations, your process for investigation, which is cl quite clearly determined and laid out, which I think many uh, of the people watching this would find very useful. And I certainly use it. Yes, our, our, um, so with our methodology, I, I think we could, uh, we could disseminate it a little bit more. We, we are very open about it. We've spoken to, to numerous forums about the methodology. Have we written it down in one place? Um, and yes, we have, because we have our own procedures. Uh, should we share those procedures with others? Um, yeah, I think there's a case for it. I'll certainly take that one away. Uh, we get lots of, we get this request many times, and I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's time we, we made it more accessible to, to others. Um, we th it works for us, and we believe the methodology is sufficiently simple for, 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 for people to pick up pretty quickly. As I say, the principles of accident investigation are simple. The practice of doing investigation can be far more complicated, but the actual principles should always be simple. We don't want to get lost in the methodology. We want to get lost in the evidence gathering. Okay, I just have time for one or two more then. Perhaps if we could look at the, uh, the later ones and provide some answers uh, together, Simon, at another point, because uh, they're, yeah, they're sure. coming in quite... Um, Oh, I think this is, again, you mentioned it. How severe does an accident have to be for RAIB to be called into an investigation? Uh, it's, a, it's a very good question. I'll, I'll try and answer it very quickly. Um, at a certain level, if, it, if an, uh, an accident involves um, uh, a derailment and collision which results in a fatality or five or more serious injuries, then it's mandatory and we must investigate. And that's in our own regulations. That's an obligation on us. However, there are many accidents and incidents which don't meet those criteria, which are nevertheless very important. And we have a defined criteria for deciding what to investigate. Yes, severity is a factor because there is a societal interest in severe events and that's normal and that's appropriate. However, it's not the only factor. The other factor we take into account is the potential for safety learning. So sometimes we will pick up a relatively minor event because the safety learning is really important and is new and is different and needs to be disseminated. So that is a, that is a criteria that all three branches, air, marine and rail use. Severity, but also potential for safety learning. And ultimately, that's a decision made by the chief inspector, but it's a decision I take very seriously. Do we get it right 100% of the time? No, no one's infallible. But I believe that we have a structured process and pick up 
the investigations of most interest to potential safety learning. I think can we go to the final question? And it, it's really interesting, this one. Um, it crossed my mind with the uh, Manchester Arena. How important is RAIB's role in improving the venues and stadium security and safety, especially considering the terrorism passengers who reach those venues through rail and metro systems? So when we have inbuilt systems, you get trains almost turning up on the doorstep of um, events where you've got, say, for example, Manchester Arena, the station interface. Would RAIB have anything in there? Oh, it's uh, it at the moment. It's 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 beyond our beyond our powers. It's beyond our remit, yeah. and we're very we're very careful not to move beyond our remit. Um, we'd have to believe we had particular expertise. However, I would say that whoever investigates such questions uh, ought to do it in light of the principles we work under. In other words, independence, expertise, and 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 systematic analysis, um, because these principles can be applied to any accident. They can be applied to Man Manchester Arena. Uh, um, a tragedy, they could be applied to a nuclear accident, they could be applied to a military accident, they could be applied to a hospital accident. Um, so all of the, these principles work anywhere, but no, we don't get directly involved in that type of, uh, of incident, not at the moment. Um, it could be at some future date, they decide to expand our, our scope. Nothing's impossible, but uh, uh, no, not at the moment. Okay. So I'll, I'll bring to a conclusion the webinar. Now, it's probably one of the most um, highly attended webinars that I've had the pleasure to host with the most questions I've received as well and, and interest. So if I could uh, thank um, you very much once again for, well, the response has been really positive. I can see that on all the questions. Uh, and I think, you know, if people do look at the REIB reports, I think they'll find them absolutely immense in their usefulness and also look at the RAIB regulations which uh, helps with your investigation as well on the process that's followed. So Simon thank you very much and to everyone who's attended from around the world. It's, it's been a pleasure thank you very much to, to everyone and um, look forward to uh, talking to the uh, rail group again at some <laughs> maybe beyond my retirement. <laughs> I, uh, I think there must be some uh, people overseas invite, invite you now. <laughs> okay, right. thank you very much. And uh, that concludes our webinar, this webinar um, today. Thank you very much.